Hey guys, it's Robert Gardner here in the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. It's a pleasure to have Crystal Howard and Ian McIntosh on the program. They're with the Florida State Massage Therapy Association. I'm going to let each of them tell them a little bit about themselves and their involvement with the Florida State Massage Therapy Association, but I look forward to our podcast today. Hello, my name is Crystal Howard. I am the president of the FSMTA, as we like to call it, FSMTA, Florida State Massage Therapy Association. I've been a massage therapist for over 22 years, and I got involved with our association probably just a little less than 10 years ago, and interacted with a lot of great massage therapists, and glad to be here speaking with Robert today. Nice. And Ian, what about you? My name is Ian McIntosh. I am the first vice president of the FSMTA and the director of legislative affairs. So I get to handle all the fun stuff to deal with Tallahassee and the Board of Massage. I've been a therapist for 20 years and teach continuing education and still run a full-time practice. Yeah, when when Ian and I were talking, when he sorry, because I'm a CE provider myself, and when I went, oh, okay, oh yeah, he's busy. <laughs> I, I'm a CE provider. I relate. So are you working just in your private practice? Well, yes, I, I have my own office located in South Orlando. I'm dual licensed. So I'm both a massage therapist and an esthetician. Mm -hmm. And I also have my husband, I have an IT company as well. So I handle the books for that. <laughs> nice. So what are some of the issues you guys wanted to, uh, to talk about? I'm very freewheeling. You guys feel free to take over. It's more to spotlight you. I think, Crystal, did you have like a short list you made? Yeah, I have a little bit of a list. I think always we have something ongoing. I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest things, and Ian and I have talked about this, we probably talk about it almost every day, is some of it is the lack of information that a lot of therapists seem to have about those really important aspects of our profession, like the license, our licensure. And some of these things that you always see a lot of questions on social media about things that we should really learn in a lot of our laws and rules classes. Here in Florida, every two years, you have to take a laws and rules class and that changes and can change. Like this last year, we had a big change that happened in our scope of practice. But I think one of the things that's important is for therapists to be not only vested in the CEs they take for modalities and what they're going to bring to their clients, but also some of that business acumen and understanding the laws that govern their profession, because something can change. And just like that, they could find themselves under the purview of, you know, the board of massage saying, Hey, you didn't do this. This was something that was changed and you didn't follow this law. So I think we really would like therapists to keep up to date with with those licensed statutes. Well, and that's why whenever, whenever I'm talking to any group of therapists, whatever state you're in, make sure you're taking a up-to-date laws and rules course. A lot of therapists want to take the booklets and uh, the booklets are fine. However, you're going to find that a lot of those are outdated. Uh, I think our board of massage here found some of uh, those courses to be outdated by almost 10 years. So, you know, every year laws can change. Every board meeting for a board of massage, the rules can change. So if you're not learning from somebody who is in the know, you could be working outside of scope or in against the board in some way, shape, or form. And that could uh, be a detriment to your practice. When I hear students and they go, well, what is Texas? And I go, have you read the state law? And they're like, <laughs> oh, no, I, that's way too long. And I'm like... Uh, guys. <laughs> and then let me ask you, in Texas, are you guys under uh, Department of Health? Are you under... Uh, very, very controversial. And this is one okay. of those things that amongst colleagues, we can we can have these drinks. We're nor I'm having Topo Chico today, but this is a whiskey conversation. <laughs> we used to be under the Department of State Health Services. Okay. And for a lot of states, that's considered an upgrade because you're part of healthcare. Right. We're now under the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, okay, which yeah. some massage therapists saw as a demotion of sorts. But nothing about the law changed. It's just that the bureaucracy that was handling massage regulation 
TDLR also had an, a public image of being quicker, more effective, and they could handle certain things. I don't know exactly how that change came about because I'm, I'm too busy focusing on CE classes and just, you know, teaching and doing my thing. But that's where uh, Texas is currently, is we're under TDLR, the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, and we're no longer under the, the Department of State Health Services. Okay. Well, so I hold two licenses here in Florida. And then about nine years ago, I got my license in Illinois. In Illinois, they are licensed under the professional business regulation. It's like IPFR, professional financial regulation in Illinois. So it's, it's I think, kind of looked at a little bit more like personal services. The issue in Florida and the reason a lot of therapists don't understand why we have so much law. We are under Department of Health, and not only are we under Department of Health as the Massage Therapy Practice Act, we're also governed by the Florida healthcare professions. So what applies to most chiropractors and PTs and occupational therapists applies to us. So it's one of those things because it's under the Department of Health here, we have a few more things we have to do and it does put us, they do view it as health care in yeah. the state. So, yeah, I know, I know about half the states are health under Department of Health and half the states are under license regulation. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting. Um, yeah, students teaching CE classes, COVID was weird and it grew, just put a burr in my ass because <laughs> it was like some states before COVID like allowed online education or didn't. And then because of COVID, some of them like loosened up laws, but then students are contacting me and I'm like, there's 50 sets of rules. I don't know. I don't know what the hell your state allows. I don't have legal contacts in your state and I don't have a team of lawyers to tell me what I can do when I turn on cameras on the internet and stream to you live from four camera angles in 15 minutes. Well, and, and, and you're right. And that is the thing, understanding what their board of massage dictates as far as CEs. But, you know, that's my thing with my Illinois license. I, I have to have courses that are NCTMB. That's fine. But here in Florida, we are the unique animal in the fact that if you're in Florida, your courses, even if they're NCTMB approved, they have to be Florida board of massage approved. So, and I think my I'm going to say my thought about that is because we do have over 38,000 massage therapists here in Florida. We have such a large number of therapists that I know the board was concerned a number of years ago, and Ian could probably speak a little more to it, just with making sure that these classes were valid classes. You know, not only does the board of massage protect consumers from massage therapists, I hate to put it that way, but they also protect the massage therapists that are consumers for the CE providers. So I think they were looking at it from that very clear perspective to make sure that those classes were actually true and valid and how it had substance to them. Yeah, and I can add a little more to that. Uh, at one point, you could be an NCB provider and whenever you applied with the state of Florida, you basically got carte blanche to put whatever classes you wanted. Like literally I could go, if it was how it was five years ago, I could go on right now and just type in whatever class that I want to teach, you know, basket weaving for massage therapists. And, um, and it would be, it would have been approved. So they, the board happened to see a lot of these courses starting to come under fire. So they started making it to where the providers have to submit their, their class syllabus and the information regarding said classes. And it does go through the approval process. You are an approved provider in the state if you're NCB. Your courses, however, have to be reviewed. The review uh, process, yeah. is that only through CE Broker now? Well, CE Broker, you submit it through them, and then the Board of Massage Therapy actually reviews said classes to ensure that they, they do work within scope. Yeah. And I know you had an issue, Robert. I think you had said about a couple classes you were trying to send through Florida. Yeah, and so forever today. The, the thing is, you 
you know, from my perspective, you're a CE provider, you're in Texas. And to give you the, the viewers at home, if you catch this and you're wondering about massage regulation. So <laughs> Texas never waived the online class issue, which means you can't take online classes for any hands-on subject related to massage for CE credit in Texas. I have a social media marketing class, which they will go, okay, yeah, that's fine, because it's not hands-on. 95% of what I do is run four camera angles live through a YouTube feed. I allow students to call me live with questions and answer their questions interactively. I cannot give CE credit for what I just mentioned because Texas never waived that rule during COVID. They said, nope, you still have to take your class in person or you could take theory, some kind of theory class online. Then people would contact me because I'm all over Facebook groups and somebody's in Florida and they're like, can I use your class for credit? And I go, oh, let me go to do some research. And then it's like, I run into CE broker and they're like, no, you have to submit it. Even though it's nationally approved, you have to submit it to CE broker. And then the Florida state board is going to look at it. And I swear to you, I think it took two years once I submitted the stuff for the Florida board to finally approve it. But then the other night when I went to search, and this may be, I just don't know how CE Broker functions or maybe it's search engine. It was like, I couldn't find my courses listed when I was searching for them. If I go into their dashboard, which is my, my dashboard, I can find it. But all I could find were the sponsored classes through CE Broker, which means that they're taking money to advertise. And I'm like, oh my God, can I just turn on my cameras and go to YouTube? This is very direct to consumer. Like, it's like, what, what am I doing here? Come on now. It's like, I want it to be streamlined and easy. And I think that we would all agree that we want some degree of quality control. The question would be is how do we obtain that? Well, I'll say when I was licensed, when I first got licensed in 99 with CE renewals, you could do all distance learning. At that time, you know, 20, 22, almost 23 years ago, you could do all of your courses distance learning if you wanted. They changed that, I believe, in maybe 2004. They changed. And so in Florida, what we have are we have 24 CEs required in a two-year renewal period. 12 of those have to be, everyone refers to them as hands-on. What our board refers to them as is gen uh, relevant to massage. So relevant to massage with either a demonstration by instructor or trade has to be that visual element to be able to replicate or whatever. And typically that is live. And like you said, I, I'm, I find it interesting that Texas didn't at least waive that during COVID because I mean, for our people, we're talking throughout 2020 and 2021, lots of people didn't want to get together. I mean, Shackles. there were a lot of, you know, it was, yeah, there were, Jackals. yeah, yeah, that's, I, I, that's surprising to me. So, yeah. so here's the funny thing. So Florida approved the, the 12, the 12 relevant to massage hands-on, but it couldn't just be, you couldn't just show a live video. You had to submit it to the board as a broadcast live. Correct. Uh, okay. Yeah. If, if you already had a live class, which would be an in-person, somebody would come and you would do the course together, that would be fine. That's still live. But if you wanted during COVID, during this renewal period, what you had to do was just resubmit your class as a broadcast live. Yeah. So you were going to do a webinar. You were going to keep track of everyone that was in attendance. You were going to be able to interact the whole bit. And then, or you could do the live with like some sort of measure to prove like a test at the end or some, something that could be a recorded course is fine, but there has to be something that you're proving you actually watched at least something and understood some component of it. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah some, that kind of, that, some people, students, they're almost, I, I've embraced online education to the point where they're like, are you not teaching in person anymore? And I'm like, Guys, I can stream to 10,000 people at once. I, I talk to my subscribers. I'm like, listen, I can, I can go to YouTube. I can live stream to you two hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year. You guys ready to go? And they're like, <laughs> wait, what? And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, the pain, the anguish. Like, 
I'm not getting rid of in-person classes. I love teaching right. in person. Who doesn't like to get right. massage in person? Well, but that is, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so much, <laughs> well, well, it's so much, it's, you know, the in-person component is necessary. We are a tactile, we are a tactile profession. So there is a component that has to be there, but anytime, if you look at like an intro class, where you're just going to tell me a little bit about a modality I might not know, that's going to really be more general. And that's really going to be something that maybe I can watch you do a small portion of demonstration. I mean, there's a component, I think there's a bridging that's going with a lot of people wanting to do some hybrid classes, wanting to do, you know, some components distant, some components live. I do think that people get that it really hits a little more home. It's kind of that difference between learning something when you type it versus when you actually write it down. There's a reinforcement there when there's a tactile component. You know, It's a supplement. And right. what I keep telling the students is I'm like, listen, get six massage therapists in your living room. You can call me live. You're all working on each other, giving hands-on feedback. I'll stream to you five days a week, two hours a day. And they're like, but I want hands-on. And I'm like, oh my God. Well, and that's the thing. Great. Take a two-day hands-on course. And then when you want to reinforce, but then, then when you, because, you know, two days, two days with most anything you're learning new, it's not enough to no, get out there yeah, doing it. Yeah. So, right. So why not have these enhancements? I've done that. I've taken, I've taken a weekend course and then purchased a home steady to be able to follow up and work on additional components that add to what I've already learned because I've already learned some of those basics, I can continue to grow with what, what's available either online or video. Yeah, makes sense. Well, and I just wanted to add also, you know, it, I, I think the culture of continuing education needs to change as far as how, how a lot of therapists view it <laughs> you know, because so often, and they see it as a burden instead of an opportunity. Yes, and it, yes. The, oh, please, yeah. God, can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> exactly. So, well, so when I teach, one of the things I tell people is, are you a bare minimum therapist? Are you giving your clients the bare minimum? Then why are you treating your education the same way? Because you're not giving it your all. You're not giving as much as you can to your clients if you're not actively out there trying to find classes that will enhance what you can do to help your clientele. Exactly. I'll get off my soapbox now. Well, but it's the same too. When <laughs> school does not, your education, your learning and what you're doing does not end the moment you finish massage school. It's a chef. A chef doesn't open a restaurant a month after he's finished, you know, going to school and being, oh, I'm going to be, you know, a Michelin, you know, restaurant. No, no, it's not the way it's going to work. It takes time. I mean, you look at people that just something, you know, chef school, pastry chef school, then they have to earn them, you know, kind of earn their, earn their stripes, whatever it is going through, you know, all the supporting roles to work their way up to head chef. And it's not exactly like it's the same with ours, but everything we take enhances what we do. I was not the same therapist two years out of school that I was five years, that I was eight years, that I was at 15 years. You know, it's, there's an evolution that happens in your career and how, you know, even now, I, I, a couple of, let's say, say the last year, I went back to giving a lot of my clients that real basic, let's just get you super relaxed so that I can get into the work I need to get into. Because too many people, especially in these last couple of years, you can't even get them just to relax. You hear, you hear therapists you know, complaining about that. I can't get them to let go. Well, you're going to have to find a way to do it. Telling them doesn't make them let go. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> Relax. Yes, <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> Telling them doesn't do it. You're going to, I mean, I've had to go back to some of those really basic, lighter, slower touch that I did years ago, just to get to the point where then I can get deeper. And that's not something I've had to do in the last few years, able to facilitate a little quicker transition, but not, not in this last year or so. Uh, a lot of students, I mean, the body work I teach is weird. It's like basically time massage, <laughs> mat based, clothes on. So yeah. tables featured in the beginning, but it's mostly mat based. So students are like, this is crazy, you know, but not I think there were, there were more often they had questions about business. And I would answer those questions about business. And, and then I realized, oh yeah, this is not, 
In Florida, how many hours is core curriculum? 500. 500. Okay, so it's the same thing here in Texas. It's 500. And they're like, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't teach us this in school. And I'm like, they only had 500 hours. Right. Yeah. Know. Like typically the business component is like 10 hours. They're not teaching yeah. you about yeah. TikTok. <laughs> like, I'm talking marketing, right? No, I'm yeah. kind of caught between, I think, older educators who are in massage schools and the younger, like 19 year olds in my class. And I'm yeah. trying to bridge the gap. So like Ian was like, oh, you're pretty good with this tech and stuff. And it's like, oh, I, I've learned how to press buttons and watch YouTube tutorials with the best. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't think your position is unique. Our position is the same. We're caught between the older therapists who understand the value of being connected with an association and being connected with their fellow therapists and younger therapists who don't understand what purpose it would serve. It's, I think there's a lot of areas in our industry that are like that. There's a huge bridge between the more experienced and more involved and the lesser experienced or newer and those perspectives. I have no idea. Because when you start talking about 50 states, dude, it's just, <laughs> it's like the AMTA chapter of the group in Illinois that doesn't include Chicago. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. I right. tried to explain to some of the students recently, or some of the teaching assistants who were starting to teach for me, mm -hmm. they haven't had a chance to travel out of state yet. And one of the things I noticed as I started to travel out of state is there's a, it's, it's a weird culture, but there's a massage subculture. And it changes regionally based on the schools and the teachers that those people were influenced by. Okay. Okay. It's subtle, so but it's like, you know, South Louisiana, where I grew up, is different than Central Texas, is different than where you guys are in Florida. But I massage culture that. changes a little bit, too, I think. I, I could kind of see that. Here, I think we have a variety. I mean, with the number of therapists we have, how many therapists are in Texas? Ooh, I, I don't know. I don't know numbers. So, also, so, COVID has kind of hurt things. I suspect numbers have dropped. Well, it's funny. It's a half and half. So the schools really went to, I mean, the basic foundation education went to home study. So it went to students learning remotely and not having some of that in person for extended period of time. Some close their programs for a while, but then you've got that component. And then we've heard from therapists. It seems like there's a huge, it's both ends of the spectrum. We've heard a lot of therapists after our shutdown, we were shut down for about six to eight weeks, could not practice, could had to sh you know, shut our offices unless you were specifically working like we do know a couple of therapists that were working at a hospital that were working on those emergency care workers that were right there on the front lines, but most anyone couldn't work for several weeks. And then everyone got back on, you know, got back into working. And we've heard from therapists, either they closed their practice, they were slow, slow, they hadn't been able to get back on track and they found a different career or decided to take a hiatus. And then we've heard other therapists saying, I'm busier than I've ever been. I'm working six days a week. I can't, you know, it's 10 hours a day. So we haven't heard anybody in the middle. Everybody is on either end of the spectrum, kind of COVID and post COVID. So I think it has changed. The necessity for massage is far greater. There are more people wanting to get massage because that whole isolation kept the population you know, really missing interaction with people and definitely missing touch. So I don't know how we haven't maybe launched a little more forward and become. Uh, it'll, it'll bump. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I think this definitely COVID has definitely opened that door for people who weren't aware of massage or getting massage. I think there are more people doing that now. Yeah. It, it's so uh, vast. I have, again, students, that are, they'll, they'll be in a specific state and they're asking some question related to the law in their state. And I'm like, yo, some guy just wrote me an email because he was trying to download something from Slovenia. <laughs> I, I know it's in Eastern Europe. I don't know where the hell Slovenia is. <laughs> Blessings to you. And I don't give a shit what the massage laws are in Slovenia. Like, it's like, I sell information on the internet. Let's go. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, I mean, that is, it's, there's so much out there now and this, we do need more people to be more comfortable digitally. And you're talking about the business component. That's not the big focus in school, but a lot of people need those business classes and good business classes. How many classes have you seen where you kind of go, eh, you're not really telling me anything that's going to give me some substance. And then the other ones that knock them out of the park. I mean, long term, so I think quality works. Right. If, if it like for me, it was always like a very, my whole attitude as a massage therapist and then as a massage instructor and CE provider was very much like a plumber. Like the people didn't care what I dressed like or how I spoke, as long as the plumbing was fixed when I was done. <laughs> and I kept saying, if you just keep giving them quality work and quality education and continue to make it better and mm -hmm. educate, you know, the business will, will grow and that worked really well for me, but it has led to some different situations. So for instance, students will ask me, they're like, I don't understand why you got this podcast. And I go, I just networked with the Florida State Massage Therapy Association. Right. Well, anytime right. Crystal or Ian have some sort of issue and they need some help with something, they can call me up and get some help and you're networking. But now we're digitally networking. Right. This right. is digital word of mouth. And then this video goes on YouTube and there's a link to the FSMTA, but that FSMTA link is linking back to my website. So now there's more search engine optimization on Google. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there's a method to the madness. In the short term, we get a nice conversation. In the long term, I take clips of this video, float them around on YouTube, Instagram. It's like, it's creating a bigger digital signature. But you know, you're right. You, you hit it right on the head. The networking and connecting, that is the biggest thing. I'll tell you with FSMTA, um, I knew about, I heard about FSMTA when I was just out of school, wasn't familiar with it. Friends of mine had joined. I did not at that time. I went to, you know, I went to work. I, I found, you know, the other associations I belong to all, I belong to both ABMP and AMTA and FSMTA. So I'm very well-rounded in the amount of resources that I have and the amount of, you know, connections that I have. But for me, when I joined FSMTA and started going to our chapter meetings, it just opened a whole new world of connectivity for me to be able to have people in my area I could refer to. I don't do pregnancy massage, but I have a friend who does. I don't do reflexology, but I have a massage therapist friend who does. So when there are things that I want to refer out, I can refer to people I personally know, and I know their work, and I've worked with them. And when I look to bring people into a job, if I, I have a friend that does a gig that he usually needs about 12, 14 massage therapists, I call all my FSMTA contacts because I, I know their work. So it's funny how many people, but it wasn't like that for me. My first 10 years of working on my own, I didn't interact with hardly any massage therapists. So it's weird how it just kind of opened this world of, wait, there's a ton of therapists that I can talk to out here. And it's yeah. not like I didn't know that, but I had to find them. And my story is very similar as well. I, I got into the profession. My instructor, whenever I, I was going through massage school, she was actually the president of our FSMTA chapter. So I was familiar with it. However, no one really explained to me the importance of belonging. And one of the things that I try to let people know in Florida is we are here uh, to help them legislatively, to help protect uh, the therapists. You know, the board is there to protect the public. We feel our role is to protect massage therapists in their role. And when COVID happened and we were shut down in 2020, because of us being a state organization, we had got notice that the Palm Beach County therapists were not allowed to return back to work because they had us lumped in with tanning salons and what a hair salons, different things like that. And we had to educate them that we are part of the healthcare profession in the state of Florida. Once our organization contacted their uh, government relations person for Palm Beach County, they amended their mandate and allowed the therapist there in that county to get back to work. In addition to that, we also saw that they had lumped acupuncturists in that as well. And with massage and acupuncture, in, in my opinion, working so well together, we also educated them that they were part of the Department of Health as well. 
So we helped get them back to back to work at, you know, and each organization, you know, Crystal mentioned AMTA and ABMP and FSMTA, each organization has their own place and we all have something to offer. And in Florida, it's the fact that we can, we can affect change at the local level. And that's huge because how many times have you heard of therapists having problems with a local municipality, whether it be with their, their business tax receipt or new mandates being put into effect because you have people that are ignorant to our profession. And that's, that's part of also just kind of going back with, I mean, I guess that's kind of part of connecting with therapists. We want people to be connected with each other. What's going on that's not right in your area? What's going on that is? What can you share that, you know, might be good for other therapists to know about? Right now, I just got a phone call today from someone who's looking to move to Florida from New York. And they're a member. We have, mem we have you don't have to be a, a, a therapist in Florida to be a member. We have members in Texas and North Carolina and Arkansas and Illinois. <laughs> so they're kind of considered our members at large. So, <laughs> but, but there's a gentleman moving to Florida and he wants to know if we have some connections of some people that might be able to guide him towards assisting with the move, or sometimes it's more than just massage. It's, it may be, you know, a personal issue. I've got a house I'm selling, I'm moving to another part of Florida, but you establish personal connections along with your professional connections. And, you know, before you know it, you're able to help, you know, a client, you're able to help another therapist, you're able to help yourself. Uh, just within a lot of those connections. I'd like to see more therapists doing that. And that's where I am happy with the opportunity with Zoom and a lot of this digital gives us a better opportunity to connect with each other. And then I get tons of hate mail from people I never met. <laughs> I, I, I understand that. I understand that quite well. <laughs> Like Judy, Judy in Omaha doesn't like something I said. And I'm like, Judy, scroll. <laughs> well, you know, isn't that funny? So isn't that funny that you would say that though? Just like, I mean, I both love and hate social media because the funniest thing to me is I can put something that is so just informative or we can have something out there on Facebook or Instagram, or whatever. That's just here. It's, you know, something three sentences it's very informative it's just giving you you know just some simple information it's good to know and man people will jump on that like it's like you you know like it's blasphemy and you're like i'm just sharing some important information that's good for you to know <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then somebody will put something like totally off the chain and everyone will be like, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Like, wait, nobody's, nobody's going after that. It's like a reversal. Like the sharks are going after the green leafy vegetables and, you know, <laughs> and the, and the sardines are going after the, the chum. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just... I, I prepare students because I promote social media use heavily and I'm like, just make, yeah. just make yeah. simple videos of like what you do and talk about how you help people with back pain, you know, that sort of thing. And they always kind of come back to me and they're like, oh, so I left like a negative comment. And I'm like, what did it say? And they're like, what did it say? I was fat. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's tons of losers on the internet. <laughs> right. Right. There's, there's no shortage, but like, the difference is if you do anything, somebody's going to criticize, right. but if you make video and show people who you are, you're going to find the clients that want to work with you and it right. builds kind of a digital word of mouth, you know, right. like, don't, don't worry about too much about that. Like, even I get that. Don't, don't worry about that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that's, that really is what it is. The, the information is out there and there's a lot of information about out there and i hope that most people would kind of glean what is very relevant and not always you know go with what's kind of don't always believe the craziest it's not always true <laughs> <laughs> well in and what's funny is uh, a couple of years ago, there was, there was some people posting on Facebook that uh, they were going to try and deregulate massage therapy in the state of Florida. Yeah. And I, 
I had already seen the deregulation bill, and the only place it mentioned was skincare professionals could not advertise as massage therapists under Chapter 480, as defined by Chapter 480. So I responded to the uh, to the post, and I I actually copied the one place that massage was mentioned, and I said they're not looking to, to deregulate. What they're looking to do is just make sure that these people aren't trying to purport themselves as massage therapists. The person said thank you, immediately took the post down. Well, then a couple of days later, someone else did the same thing, and I responded with the same same thing that I did with the first guy, and. This person goes, oh, no, I have it on good authority that the governor and one of the uh, senators, they're going to try and slide it in there at the last minute. Well, I had this person's phone number, so I immediately called them and I said, hey, you know, I just wanted to have a chat with you about the post on Facebook, because if I'm misinformed, I want to know and I want to be able to contact our uh, lobbyists. And if your person's misinformed, I want to help educate them. Never heard a thing. You know, I think some people are just agents of chaos on, on the internet. <laughs> I, that's me. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't well, think you... there was a, there was an interesting EdNet is a massage therapist group on Facebook for massage educators. And there was a conversation and I don't remember the organization's name, but they were doing something to take portions of core curriculum and it was a non hands on portions and make it automated and online in some form. And school owners in Texas were, you know, rallying the troops to get this, you know, shut down. And I'm like, oh man, it's like what I see fundamentally, it's not just the massage industry, by the way. Right. I think it's, right. it's across all industries and particularly during COVID. I had a, a colleague who talked to me because he knew I taught heavily online pre-COVID. And he's like, oh, you're going to have competition now. And I'm like, him, there are 800 hours of my classroom instruction online for $7 a month. Right. I can turn on cameras in 15 minutes and stream from four camera angles with anatomy on screen with perfect audio and answer phone calls live. There's a long way to go before anybody catches up. Right, right. The difference is I see a piece of, like when you think about, don't, don't think about replacing core curriculum or replacing hands-on touch or contact hours. The supplementation process is very hard for me to argue with because it's easily reproducible, you know, less expensive to deliver. So it's like kind of think about that core curriculum piece, but now you have an online portal where you could access information at will to be able to review, refresh, you know, or while you're in school. And I could see why an organization could see a financial motive to take the components of core curriculum that they could and put it online. But the pushback against it is I feel like school owners, at least in Texas, I feel like fundamentally they're fighting online education. I don't know how they're going to win that battle, but right. it's like this technology continues to get smaller and more potent. And it's just a matter of who can put out information inexpensively that draws people in to continue educating them. It's like, I don't want the quality of education or massage therapy to go down. It's just right. the opposite. We might have a difference of opinion of how that is accomplished, but I keep supplementing as heavily as I can related to the curriculum I'm teaching because I have students who write me who have never taken an in-person in -person class with me who are like, dude, you transformed my entire practice for seven bucks. And I'm like, well, great, good, let's go. Well, and you think about, I mean, when I was in school, you could visit the school library there were videos yeah. to check out. There were, I mean, so so what part of this, you know, a good portion of the online component replaces some of what you would have in school, the, the whole video library that you would have in school. It, and, and if it's live, like a lot of your courses are, then you're saying, you know, you can actually have interaction. So it's not just a video that you're distanced from. Yeah. You can actually interact with someone who's teaching it. So yeah, I mean, edu there's such a variety of, there's so much different media that can be used to enhance education. Yeah, I think that's the thing, as long as that core 
that that core and touch stays pretty solid. That's what we're most concerned about. You know, you can't necessarily you can't feel five pounds of pressure in a yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then for me as an educator, you know, living in Austin, because I deal with students locally, in my experience, this is me, this is, this is Robert being ornery, the students don't, like, so in core curriculum, you have to go through 500 hours, that's the law, it's the rules. When you take CE classes, they'll take two days, and then you don't see them again. And I'm like, why don't we just meet once a month? And they're like, oh, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, we kind of understand that. So, so I think that would maybe be the other concern I think I have kind of staying on top of yet jumping a little bit. And that is a lot of therapists interest, you know, being vested in their profession and committing to something, something other than just the job. I mean, do you go to massage school to learn how to be a massage therapist, get your license, and then six to eight hours a day you just go to your job you go home you do is that entirely what you want do you want to get better by taking more classes do you want to get more involved you know we are a volunteer fsmta is a member driven volunteer led organization and when we say volunteer it is volunteer led so sometimes not enough volunteers. <laughs> so I don't know if there was a time when we had too many volunteers, but you know, so sometimes it's as simple as, like you said, when you're talking about classes, meeting once a month, getting together once a month, this is something for us too. We have a number of committees that do different things that help to promote a lot of education components, a lot of maybe sports massage, maybe different benefits and things require a meeting one hour a month. So that's that's not much of a commitment just to meet via Zoom Aww. for an hour. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm too busy. I don't have yeah. time for that. Yeah. And at the same time, like I'm providing stuff, $7 a month is a subscription online, right? right? Then they're like, but I want to go to Hawaii. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's funny how you're broke, but like you want to go to Hawaii. <laughs> You know, and that, and that's, I think, what, what you're offering, what you talk about, too, the sub subscription component, that's huge. I mean, honestly, a subscription and membership component nowadays, you know, back when, let's go back 20, 30 years, gyms were the only ones that offered memberships. But now you have, you know, Massage Envies and a lot of the franchises. There's a whole membership component, so people getting, wanting regular appointments can get a discounted rate. There are all kinds of therapists opening their own practices that they have, they've introduced some sort of membership. So as a CE provider, I think, I don't know how many other CE providers are offering a subscription component. I don't think it's very many. Very few. There's, yeah. a, there's a handful I know of, but very, very right. few. Yes. But I mean, if you have an extensive amount of videos, it makes sense to be able to have, right? I mean, They're again, like, that, there's a business idea right there. They're like, scroll, like, dude, it, it's 800 hours. They're like, dude, what, how? And I'm like, I recorded everything since 2017. And they're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, Robert, one thing I don't want to forget to tell you about that I think you would, you would specifically appreciate, specifically appreciate. The Florida scope, of, our scope of practice last year so our scope of practice here in Florida used to be called the Massage Practice Act. Mm -hmm. And we were able to, after what, you know, it was about 10 years of, of work. Yes. Several people were put, put almost 10 years of work. We just needed some words cleaned up. Just some word, just some simple words cleaned up. So it went from being the Massage Practice Act to the Massage Therapy Practice Act. Because just adding the word therapy makes a big difference, <laughs> you know? And so one of the other things that got changed in the practice was the word assessment. And so we already as therapists assess, you know, we do, what are the contraindications? What are the indications? You know, am I going to touch that area, not touch that area? Is there something going on that I need to avoid? You know, so the inclusion of the word assessment and we were able to include the word knee, which would be word treating, so uh, what is it? Manipulating soft tissue with the use of hand, elbow, you know, we include, got the word knee included in there. And the explanation 
because legislators don't entirely know. One of our bill supporters, <laughs> you know, because yeah, people seem to assume they know everything and they really don't. But one of our bill supporters, she said, how do I explain this when I'm on the floor talking about some of these, you know, things? And when it came to me, we said there are modalities that can use the knee to get some of the work. And we mentioned Thai massage. Thai massage can have a variety of different, like you talk about working on the you know, sports massage. We had to kind of pull all those modalities that might use the knee as a leverage point, as a, to, you know, provide pressure, whatever the case might be. And so she was able to actually, you know, even in doing chair massage, you might use the knee, you know, in, in some different positions. So she was actually able to explain that to the legislators so that they would understand. But I, I figure since you, you know, do some of this, you know, different type of modality and using tie and some different things, you'd appreciate actually using a portion of the body that we do use, you know, not, you know, it kind of falls in line there. And the, the other thing that I would like to bring up since Crystal mentioned it, so many therapists talk about, well, I want this. I want our profession to be like that. We have been on top of this for years and we finally got it through. We've, we've actually, we're coming off of three years of positive legislative achievements here in Florida. However, the addition of the word therapy to our practice act was, was kind of an easy sell. Where the legislators got hung up was with the word assessment. Now, you would think, why would they have a problem with the word assessment? So for one, some of them thought it was diagnosis. No, we're not here to diagnose. We're just here to reiterate what we already have to do to help the people that we work with. And then there were a lot who thought that it was going to require insurance companies to pay for massage therapy assessment. It's interesting that the legislators don't realize that it's the doctors that actually write the script. So if the doctor doesn't sign off for massage therapy assessment, it's not going to be required to be paid for by insurance in the first place. But it, it, they get hung up on the minutia of stuff so when people get frustrated in their area because the law hasn't changed or it's difficult getting changed, they got to realize it is a slow process because, you know, it's, it moves at the speed of frozen molasses, basically, is what it, what no, it amounts to. it moves to. as fast as my four cameras on the internet through YouTube in 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, and it's government, it's, it's regulation. So yeah. this is one of those things. If And I, I like to tell when I speak at schools and talk to different people, I moved from Illinois to Florida because in for, to, to go to school for massage and get licensed because in 1998, only 25 states had licensure. And I didn't want to work. And I didn't live in the Chicago area of Illinois. I lived down in the farm area. So a little further south. So for me, I wanted to be in a state where I was going to hold a license. So for the people that don't feel we need to be licensed, yes, it can sometimes be a burden, but it's also one of those things that it validates what you do. And if you don't look, if you don't look at, if you can't look at it that way, then maybe you need to rethink why and what you're doing. It's, you know, you want to make sure that what you're doing is respected, is trusted. And, and unfortunately, you know, it is government, which can be sticky at times, but it is validated when you hold the license. You know, Florida was the second state to take to get licensure in 1943. So, you know, and that might be a lot of what we do does have the potential to influence other states too. So that's kind of one of the key things for us. And I think why FSMTA has been around for so long and there has been, you know, we're just a, we're a, just a state association, but what Florida does influences other states. There are times you can look on other state boards when they're developing or reviewing their own laws, and literally on their agenda, it'll say Florida laws and rules. They'll be taking a look at ours to kind of see if there's something they might want to emulate. What other issues are you seeing in Florida specifically? Hmm. Well, in relation Florida, to massage regulation and so Florida is one of the key states that is typically under 
fire under concern for human trafficking. I mean, the top three states tend to be Florida, California, and New York. And the human trafficking requirement. So again, kind of just filling in on what's happened with Florida, you know, several years, many years ago, I think legislators across the country had their sights on this human trafficking problem. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to take care of this? How are we going to get rid of this? It's a scourge. And so I think a lot of states started really focusing on it. And so that's what happened here in Florida. Legislators said, you know, we have a, we've set up a human trafficking uh, task force. We want to get rid of this. So a lot of states started passing all these laws and Florida definitely was right on it to start requiring additional education and more information. And luckily, I know Ian was involved when the human trafficking requirement was coming about for Florida. A lot of therapists thought that it was a burden on us. Oh, we're going to have to take a human trafficking class. Oh, you know, and yes, it's, it is good information to know because now that I've taken the class, I don't know how many times, wow, it's kind of, you know, more, more intense than, you know, just don't, didn't know that much about it before. But the thing here is in our state, you look at massage, human traffickers often use massage as a front. So this is one of those things. We are one of the few occupations that, you know, what we do is, can be used as a front for illicit activity. And so one of the things that ended up happening in this state was, and again, a lot of therapists not happy with the regulation, all these requirements, but they did a lot of different things that still make people uncomfortable. So one thing is requiring a one CE course and it has to be approved. People used to teach human trafficking courses before, but it has to meet special requirements they made when they, when they made that requirement. The problem with that initially when they were going to make that requirement was it was going to be a class that we took outside of our normal 24 CEs. And we were like, and, well, I'm sorry. And, uh, I was going to say, and we wouldn't have got, we wouldn't have received credit for it. You, right. Within six months of being hired on in, in an establishment, you were going to be required to take a, a human trafficking class, and then they would have to sign, the facility would have to sign off. Well, these bad actors in our, our profession would have just rubber stamped them and said, oh yeah, they've had the training and that would have been that. They had no teeth. So to give a little background, originally the bill itself was just horrible. And it was coming at a time where the legislature was looking to do something. And it was the same year that Epstein first got arrested. And when Robert Kraft got caught in the, the Asian massage place in Palm Beach area here in Florida, for those that might not know, Robert Kraft is the owner of the, the New England Patriots. So, so it was high profile in the news and they were going to do something. And we could have very easily said, absolutely not. We hate this. And they would have said, thank you for your input and done whatever they wanted to anyway. Okay. So with, with our guidance, we were able to make it to where the CE requirement not only affected massage therapists, but every single medical professional in the state of Florida. So it put us all on the same line. And how we did that is we explained that the uh, medical field is one of the first lines of defense against human trafficking. And then they also wanted us to do uh, human trafficking posters while well, they applied that to the majority of the medical field as well, because they were looking to single us out for years. Uh, so by helping to educate the legislators, we made it much more palatable. And then on top of that, the... Uh, the education requirement, I made sure it was in the statute that it was not to exceed the, the 24 hours that we were already required to take. So it was going to be within those 24 hours. So a lot of therapists that are unhappy about this, they don't know where all of it originated and how much worse it could have been if we said, you know what, massage therapists don't like this. Sorry, we don't want to do it. And they would have been like, too bad. Well, so. and that's it. That's it. Some of the involvement when people are involved and can let us know certain things, that's when, when we reach out. And kind of speaking, bringing back when you mentioned taking only you know, two years to get CE courses approved, in the last few years, our board of massage, our board of massage has seven members, should have seven members. For the last, how many years, Ian, five? 
six years or four, so? Four or five years at least. Been running with four members. So no governor had appointed. We did not have a full board. In fact, a lot of the health boards here in Florida, nursing and I don't know if dentistry, acupuncture, a lot of the boards were underserved. So at last year's legislative session, Ian and I were talking to a couple of legislators and they said, what can we help you with? And we said, get our board full. Our people can't do the work they need to do. So part of that delay you may have had in getting those classes approved could have been because only one person was reviewing the classes. I, I so, know. TDLR, again, we, we were under Department of State Health Services. Now we're under right. TDLR. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to talk trash in my own state. Please yeah. don't contact no, no, me. But no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think I think under the Department of State Health Services, we, we all know how big Texas is. Right. There was one inspector for the entire state. Wow. Wow. Just for establishment inspections? Wow. Ooh. So what do you think happened like when you talk about human trafficking yeah. like in el paso right it's like i can drive wow. and i did this i taught in brownsville so i'm in in central texas i drove eight hours south brownsville. to brownsville i'm still in yep. texas down at the very yep. southern tip on the border yep. i'm like there's no inspections going on down here right. like there's no right. way that one inspector now i'm i'm assuming that's changed under tdlr but right. once you see the wiring under the board <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, it's interesting how so are different. So I'm curious too. So you know that the interstate, what is it called? Interstate license compact. There are, that's kind of in the works. A number of groups are working on trying to get some license portability. That's a conversation that's going on among a number of different groups. And I know we've got a few people we're going to be talking with. And I think, I think most people are in support of that portability, being able to go to other states like nurses do. In fact, I think our state right now is looking at a mental health professionals interstate compact. So it's good. I think the more healthcare professions we have that can look at traveling to other states and working, you know, that would be interesting if we can get a fair amount of states to, to agree to that. That's especially for therapists that are in states where they're on the edge. Some of our panhandle therapists, you know, they have opportunities to work in Alabama, <laughs> you know, or Georgia. That's, so I know that's a big kind of on the horizon. And I think we're, we're fairly well in favor of that, of that going forward. But I don't know what else I would say would be in Florida right now that I think the, the biggest thing that I'm hearing or seeing is one of the things that we do is we have local meetings among our chapters. So we have 19 chapters throughout the state. The majority of chapters hold a, a monthly meeting where there's some announcements and a CE presentation. And we're still struggling to get a lot of that back online. For the same number of therapists that say, oh, I want to get together again. I really want to connect. I really want to see everybody. Even when that kind of goes along, only maybe half of those people show up. There's still yeah. people that are hesitating to get. So I think we're really at this strange kind of precipice where it's like, yeah, we want to. I don't know. I'm a little unsure. So there's still so much uncertainty with really getting together. I don't think we're going to see a lot of stuff. I'd hate to say, I hate to say return back to normal, but that is the, the term really probably even until the end of the year. Students are asking me about on in-person classes and I'm trying to build the business so that I can have Danielle or Kristen or other students start teaching some of the basic classes so I can continue to, to grow. And I got a message from Abilene yesterday and I had to, I had to do this all the time, even for Texas and go, where's Abilene? I'm like, okay, it's west of Dallas. And I'm like, they're looking for training. Right. My target market is not Abilene. I love you if you're in Abilene, by the way, but it's right. like, just I'm, looking I'm, for I'm large... here. well, yeah, I'm here in Austin. Like I don't, right. you know, other than Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, big cities, I'm right. like, I don't know what's going on in Abilene. I don't know what's going on in Lubbock, you know, but you, you keep getting contacts and there's a challenge, which is why I've leaned so heavily towards digital supplementation to, right. you know, give them the basics in an in-person class and then continue to supplement online as much as possible to make it more accessible and available. Well, exa exactly, exactly what you've said. With our chapter meetings, we went 2020, 
2020 took a little bit to kind of get our footing because everybody's going, okay, what's going on? I don't know. So it took a few months for people to say, okay, what are we doing? But it's helped us. Some of our larger chapters or some of our chapters that are a little further out underserved, we've been able to do Zoom. And so we do have, we have a few chapters whose meetings are on the same night. So last year when they're, they can collaborate together. And so what the two do is they just, the two chapters are able to host a Zoom meeting together, give the CE presentation, you know, and, and we try to make sure that those CE presentations, you know, meet the hands-on and are posted correctly for live. And we do have a few, you know, those, that's probably, that's probably what's most difficult for us is, hey, is that the class posted to meet the right requirements? Because <laughs> we're going to get that pushback of, hey, it's not live or, hey, is this going to count? And we've got to really be on top of, you know, the presenter. Hey, is that class going to meet the criteria that people are wanting right now? Is it going to meet the live requirements? Is it going to meet what they need? And that was our push last year as we got close to renewal was, was I hate to say, sometimes we do like the board of massage. We don't always agree with the decisions that they make. I think there's also a false narrative that FSMTA is right there with the board. We do support a lot of what they do, but we don't always agree. So funny, in 2020, they started requiring an additional form for a lot of the classes. And it's not a difficult form. It just kind of breaks down, I think, Ian, what breaks down the objectives and outcomes for some of the classes. Well, Robert, if you, if you applied, then you probably filled out the form B, you know, to be a provider in the state of Florida. The problem is it doesn't give a whole lot of explanation. It just says, here's what it should say under this. Here's what it should say under this. But what they really want is they want like an hourly breakdown. Right. And it wasn't until our convention last year when one of the board staff sat down with our uh, director of educational standards and it kind of muddled through that to, to ensure that the forms were properly filled out. So we have a good working relationship with the board, which I think sometimes often gets mistaken that we are working, Four you know, lock, lockstep with the board. And it, no, we're, we're trying to have a good working relationship so we can make things easier on therapists. However, we recognize where they come from, which is protecting the public. So, well, and that's the other thing too. And it falls, I think that, uh, and so what I'm going to say next isn't unique to Florida. I think it's, it's across the whole country. And that is we are regulated. Uh, most states are regulated. And the problem is you have staff for wh whether it's Department of Business and Professional Regulation or whether it's Department of Health, when it comes to their administrative stuff, they know how to do it, they know how to do it well, but it's not clear, all that legalese and all of that administrative jargon is not something that is easily well relatable to the massage therapist. I've shared different bills when we've seen things coming up to go before legislature, and I've had therapists say, well, who can read that? I don't understand any of that. Well, right. A lot of this stuff is written. The way a bill is written is one way. The way administrative code is written when it's following up with whatever our laws might be. So I think there's something, too, that therapists automatically will disconnect because they don't understand it. It seems to be confusing because it's just so much boring, administrative. And to that, those people that do this, like the staff for the department or the staff, the aides, they know this stuff in their sleep because, you know, they've been doing it so long, they're so familiar with it. Somebody who's new to it, they can't explain. So when something does come from Department of Health, a lot of times there's confusion because it's not clear to the everyday person, to the therapist to say, wait, what does this mean? I don't understand. They haven't put it in a way that's really relatable. And so that's one of the ways that we help to bridge and break things down to say, okay, they mean this, or they mean you need to do this, this, and this. Similar to, and I've seen this in our industry, a season, you know, 30-year therapist and a one-year therapist. The 30-year therapist, half their stuff is rote mechanical. They're just doing it, you know, they just, they, they don't even think about half of what they do, whereas that one-year, th first-year therapist is kind of like questioning themselves and saying, am I supposed to do this? Do I th do that? 
And so I think it's that same type of thing. It's the familiarity and just understanding things clear. So I think that's where therapists get tripped up with a lot of legalese and, uh, and some of the laws and rules. Yeah. So you guys have any closing thoughts? We just went over an hour. Nope. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, Robert. I enjoy speaking with you. I think you've got some great, great comments and ideas, and I don't find anything to be shocking. <laughs> oh, we hadn't, I hadn't even no. said that. <laughs> Hi there. Um, where, can, uh, where can people find you guys online? So I've got F S -S sorry, fsmta.org on, on yep. here, and yep. I've got the Instagram and the Facebook. Yep. Um, do you want yep. them to follow you individually on social media? You know, typically it's easier to follow the association. Okay. I'm kind of both, you and I think are kind of hit and miss on our personal like I'll, if I'm traveling, I might be putting stuff. If I'm not, it's going to be kind of a boring run. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on everything and they contact right. me through all of it and expect me right. to keep it organized. And I'm, I don't remember if it was on Snapchat or right. Facebook Messenger <laughs> business page. I, I can't no, keep track yeah. anymore. We, we've got Twitter too. It's not utilized as much. I think I, I don't even know. You know, that's kind of a, we're got so much stuff going on but yeah just find us there and that's the thing we're open to questions i mean we have email people can send info at fsmta.org if they want to email us we are all open to emails as well it's it's not anything that you know because i think it's just the more we're connected the stronger we are yeah and cool. and i was also going to let you know robert if if you need help navigating the board of massage therapy here in florida and get with me i'll i'll see what we can do to to help help guide you along, make it a little well, easier I, for you. I got that first CE broker piece out of the way. And what I didn't know is now maybe because the first ones were approved, it might be easier as a process now, but um, I'm not exactly it, it, to me, I, I'm in Texas, so I don't, I don't know what's going on in Florida. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you do need to know what's going on in Florida, we might be able to help you out there. Cool. <laughs> well, listen, and, and uh, thank you guys. Excited again. No, I was going to say, and it's great because we love to have, we like to have CE providers, not only from Florida, you know, we've got chapters that look for CE providers to be able to offer two hour classes. You know, we look for anything. We we're definitely open to having presenters from around the country. So it's really no limitation. Other than and I was going to say, if, if you want to come visit with us at our convention this year, I think what Crystal, we're, we've been the only organization to have a yeah. massage convention in the last three years yeah we had our convention last year and we're having it again this year so yeah definitely and we took a gamble last year and it worked out really well we actually we had a it was a little cozier than normal but it was great and I think therapists need to it, that's a, a good way to connect and kind of Ian and I talked about it's kind of a pep rally a pep rally for your industry get you passionate maybe reignite any passion that you may have lost for why you do this so sometimes getting together and, you know, kind of rallying together and seeing some different things at convention is, is helpful. Cool. Well, listen, thank you guys so much for yes. being on the podcast. Thank all of you for your views. If you have any information uh, or questions, please contact them. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. And thank you to Ian and Crystal for being on board with me.